Lesson 1 for March 31 through to April 6, ready for teaching on the 7th of April. The Cosmic Controversy. Sabbath afternoon, March 31. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to the beginning of this new quarter when we're looking at important things that are happening in the world today and are to happen in the future. And as we prepare for that, as we walk our daily lives, we ask that from your word, your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us, that we may understand what is happening and what you would like us to do about it. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Once again, Revelation 12.17 from the New King James Version. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The cosmic controversy, sometimes called the Great Controversy, is the biblical worldview. It forms the background against which the drama of our world and even of the universe unfolds. Sin, suffering, death, the rise and fall of nations, the spread of the gospel, last day events, these all occur in the context of the cosmic controversy. This week we will look at a few crucial places where the controversy took hold. It began mysteriously in the heart of a perfect being known as Lucifer, who brought his rebellion to earth through the fall of other perfect beings, Adam and Eve. From these two pivot points, the fall of Lucifer and then of our first parents, the great controversy took root and has been raging ever since. Each one of us, then, is a part of this cosmic drama. The good news is that one day it will not only end, but it will end with the total victory of Christ over Satan. The even better news is that because of the completeness of what Jesus did on the cross, all of us can share in that victory. Finally, as part of that victory, God calls us to faith and obedience as we await all that we have been promised in Jesus, whose coming is assured. Sunday, April 1, The Fall of a Perfect Being If the cosmic controversy forms the background biblical worldview, this leads to a number of questions. An important one is, how did it all get started? Because a loving God created the universe, it's reasonable to assume that evil, violence and conflict certainly were not built into the creation from the beginning. Thus, the controversy must have arisen separately from the original creation and definitely not as a necessary result of it. Nevertheless, the controversy is real, it's real, and we are all involved. Question. Read Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 1 and 2 and verses 11 to 17 and Isaiah 14 verses 12 through to 14. What do these texts teach us about the fall of Lucifer and the rise of evil? First of all, Ezekiel 28, 1 to 2. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a god. And verses 11 through to 17. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, 
topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, I laid you before kings, that they might gaze at you. And Isaiah 14, verses 12 through to 14. How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer was a perfect being living in heaven. How could iniquity have arisen in him, especially in an environment such as that? We don't know. Perhaps that's one reason why the Bible talks about the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Outside the reality of the free will that God has given all his intelligent creatures, no reason exists for the fall of Lucifer. As Ellen G. White so profoundly stated it in Great Controversy, pages 492 and 493, it is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Sin is an intruder, for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found, or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. End of quote. Replace the word sin with evil, and the statement works just as well. It is impossible to explain the origin of evil so as to give a reason for its existence. Evil is an intruder, for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found, or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be evil. End of quote. So to finish the day, think about your own experiences with the reality of free will. Why should we prayerfully and carefully think about the choices we make using our free will? Monday, April 2. More than head knowledge. Although we can't explain why evil arose, since no justification for it exists, Scripture reveals that it began in the heart of Lucifer in heaven. Besides the fascinating insights that we get from the writings of Ellen G. White, for instance the chapter The Origin of Evil in The Great Controversy, Scripture doesn't tell us much more about how it started in heaven. The Word of God is more explicit, though, in regard to how it arose on earth. Question read at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through to 7. What happened here that shows Adam and Eve's culpability in what transpired? Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now the servant was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, You shall not eat of the every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, 
you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves coverings. What's so sad here is that Eve knew what God had said. God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die, in verse 3. Although, as far as the scripture tells us, God had said nothing about touching the fruit, Eve knew the truth that eating from it would lead to death. Then Satan openly and blatantly contradicted these words. The serpent said to the woman, in verse 4, You will not surely die. How much starker could the contrast be? However subtle Satan's approach to Eve was at first, once he got her attention and saw that she was not resisting, he openly challenged the Lord's command. As we have seen, Eve was not working from a position of ignorance. She couldn't claim, I didn't know, I didn't know. She did know. Yet, despite this knowledge, she did wrong anyway. If even in the perfect environment of Eden, knowledge itself wasn't enough to keep Eve, and then Adam, who also knew the truth, from sinning, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that knowledge alone is enough to save us now. Yes, we need to know what the Word of God tells us, but along with knowing that, we need the kind of surrender in which we will obey what it tells us as well. And so to finish today, God said one thing, Satan said another. Despite the knowledge that Adam and Eve had, they chose to listen to Satan. Think about how little has changed over the millennia. How can we avoid making the same kind of error? Tuesday, April 3, War in Heaven and on Earth The fall of our first parents plunged the world into sin, evil and death. People might disagree on the immediate causes or who's at fault, but who can deny the reality of the turmoil, violence, upheaval and conflict that afflict us all here? We talk about a cosmic controversy or a cosmic conflict, and that's fine and true. But whatever the cosmic origins of this conflict, it is being played out here on earth as well. Indeed, so much biblical history, from the fall in Eden up through final events leading to the second coming of Jesus, is in many ways the biblical exposition of the great controversy. We live amid this controversy. The Word of God explains to us what is going on, what is behind it, and, most important, how it is going to end. Question. Read Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through to 17. What battles does this chapter portray as unfolding both in heaven and on earth? Revelation 12, beginning at verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. 
Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea! For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But, the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We see a battle in heaven, and battles on earth as well. The first battle is between the dragon, Satan, and Michael, the Hebrew meaning, who is like God, in Revelation 12, 7-9. The rebel Lucifer became known as Satan, or adversary, who was merely a created being fighting against the eternal creator. Jesus, as we read in Hebrews 1, verses 1-2, to who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And John 1, verses 1 through to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Lucifer was rebelling against his Maker. The great controversy is not about dueling gods. It's about a creature rebelling against his Creator, and manifesting that rebellion by attacking the creation as well. Failing in his battle against Christ in heaven, Satan sought to go after him on earth right after his human birth, as we read in verse 4. Failing in his battle against Christ here, and then failing against him in the wilderness, and later at the cross, Satan, after his irreversible defeat at Calvary, went to war against Christ's people. This war has raged through much of Christian history, as we read in Revelation 12, verses 6 and 14 to 16, and will continue until the end, as it says in verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Until Satan faces another defeat, this time at the second coming of Jesus. And so to finish today, read Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through to 12. What hope do we find in these verses amid all the controversy and conflict seen in the other text? 
Revelation 12, beginning at verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Wednesday, April 4. With you always, even unto the end. The book of Revelation foretold the persecution that God's people would face through a good portion of church history. The 1,260 prophetic days of Revelation 12.6, which is also there in Revelation 12.14, point to 1,260 years of persecution against the church. Let's just check those verses. Revelation 12, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. These persecutions, Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, page 40, begin under Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with the greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities, famine, pestilence and earthquake. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready, for the sake of gain, to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion and pests of society. Great numbers were thrown to the wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheatres. As a result of persecution, The woman, the church, fled into the wilderness, it said in verse 6. She is described as having two wings like an eagle. This gives the picture of flying away where help could be found. She was taken care of in the wilderness, and the serpent, or Satan, could not get to her, as we read in verse 14. God always has preserved a remnant, even during major persecutions, and he will do the same again, in the end time. Question. In the context of the perils of the last days, Christ said to his people in Matthew twenty-eight twenty, I am with you always to the very end of the age. How do we understand this wonderful promise, even in the face of the vast martyrdom of many of his followers? Let's look at uh, Romans 8, verses 31 to 39. What Then shall we say to these things, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen." who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, 
our Lord. And Matthew 10.28 And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Nothing, not persecution, famine or death, can separate us from God's love. However, Christ's presence with us, whether now or in end times, does not mean that we are spared pain, suffering, trials or even death. We have never been promised such exemptions in this life. It means that, through Jesus and what he has done for us, we can live with the hope and promise that God is with us in these trials and that we have the promise of eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. We can live with the hope that, regardless of anything we go through, here, like Paul, we can be certain that there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Second Timothy 4 verse 8 We who have loved his appearing can claim this hope and promise for ourselves as well. Thursday, April 5, The Law and the Gospel As Seventh-day Adventists, we carry in our name so much of what we stand for. The Seventh-day part represents the Seventh-day Sabbath, which points to our belief not just in that one commandment alone, but, by implication, in all ten. The Adventist part points to our belief in the second advent of Jesus, a truth that can exist only because of what Christ did with his atoning death at his first advent. Hence, our name, Seventh-day Adventist, points to two crucial and inseparable components of present truth, the law and the gospel. Question. How do these texts indicate just how closely the law and the gospel are linked? First of all, Jeremiah 44 and verse 33. Because you have burned incense and because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord or walked in his law, in his statutes or in his testimonies, therefore this calamity has happened to you as at this day. And Romans 3, 20-26, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus and Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. The gospel is good news. The good news that though we have sinned in that we have broken God's law, through faith in what Christ did for us at the cross, we can be forgiven our sins, for our transgression of his law. Also, we have been given the power to obey that law fully and completely. No wonder, then, that in the context of the last days, as the great controversy rages in special ferocity, God's people are depicted in a very specific manner. Question. Read Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. 
How does this text reveal the link between the law and the gospel? Revelation 14 verse 12 Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so to finish the day, as Seventh-day Adventists are people who believe in obedience to God's law, how can we show others that obedience to the law is not legalism but a natural outgrowth of loving God and being saved by Him? How do such texts as Deuteronomy 11.1 1 and 1 John 5.3 buttress this point? First of all, Deuteronomy 11 verse 1 Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. And First John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Friday, April 6. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35, we read, So long as all created beings acknowledged the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfil the purpose of their Creator. They delighted in reflecting His glory and showing forth His praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies, but a change came over this happy state. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Sin originated with him who, next to Christ, had been most honoured of God. End of quote. Notice Ellen White's words, the allegiance of love. This powerful phrase, full of meaning, points to the fact that love leads to allegiance, to faithfulness. A spouse who loves his or her mate then will manifest that love through allegiance. It was that way with the heavenly host, and it should be that way with us now in our relationship to God. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. What scriptural evidence can we have that points to the reality not just of Satan, but of his role in the great controversy? How can we help people understand the reality of Satan as a personal being, and not just a symbol of the evil in the human heart? 2. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have been blessed with an incredible amount of knowledge in regard to biblical truth. As wonderful as it is, though, why is this knowledge not enough to save us? What more do we need than just intellectual knowledge? 3. What are ways in which you have experienced the presence of Jesus in your own life, even now? How can these experiences help you in whatever time of trouble you have to face? And 4. In class, talk more about the phrase, the allegiance of love. How can this idea help us to understand better the relationship between law and grace and between faith and obedience? What does it teach about the freedom inherent in the whole idea of love? In what ways, even now, can we reveal the allegiance of love? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Hawaiian Wedding Part 1 and it's by Benji Leach and Benji is a volunteer home health chaplain in Fort Worth in Texas. Sabbath afternoon began as planned. About 30 band students from Campion Academy where I worked as a chaplain distributed copies of Ellen G. White's book Steps to Christ in a town located at the foot of the Rocky Mountains in the U.S. state of Colorado. 
After that, we returned to the local Seventh-day Adventist church, where the students earlier had performed and changed clothing for a hike in nearby Rocky Mountain National Park. But when our bus stopped at a scenic lookout spot near the mountain top, I immediately wanted to turn around and leave. Dozens of people dressed in long robes greeted our eyes. At first glance, I thought they belonged to some sort of pushy Eastern religion, and I didn't want to argue with them. But the band members pleaded for five minutes to witness to these people. I reluctantly agreed. After a few minutes, a student came over to me and said, This is not an Eastern religion. This is a Hawaiian wedding. I was surprised. Why is a Hawaiian wedding being held in Colorado, I asked. It turned out that the groom was originally from Hawaii, but the student said the bride and groom had a problem. The minister was 45 minutes late. Aren't you a minister? the student asked. I assured him that the minister would arrive, but the minister didn't show up. We saw the bride crying near a car and I approached her. The woman tearfully explained that the minister had been involved in an accident and could not come to the wedding. The bride had won my sympathy now. All right, I said. I guess I can have your wedding. She looked surprised. What makes you think that you can have my wedding? She said. I am a minister, I said. You don't look like a minister. Lady, I wouldn't lie to you, I said, pulling out my wallet to show her my ministerial license. Her eyes grew big. You really are a minister. Can you do our wedding? She asked. Now, I wasn't so sure. I said to her, I want to see your wedding license. I carefully examined the piece of paper. It was in order. I guess I'll have your wedding, I said. So what are your names? The band members saw what was happening and they became excited. Several band members played music for the couple before the ceremony began. And it looks like we might have a second part to this story next week. Stay tuned. Your reader for this week's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been Dr. Percy Harold. It has been produced in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind, distributed under the auspices of the Sabbath School Department by HopeChannel.com.